good morning respected speaker dr rao vadlamudi sir convener of this program dr jagdish panda sir principals faculty members of all pharmacy colleges across india i welcoming you all for this one week faculty development program on holistic approaches for excellence in pharmaceutical education research and publishing conducted by ragu college of pharmacy visakhapatnam andhra pradesh myself jogendra kumar associate professor ragu college of pharmacy now on board we have three members along with me one is our eminent speaker of today's faculty development program dr rao vadlamudi sir and our convener of this program dr jagdish panda sir now i request dr jagdish panda sir to take over this session and introduce our eminent speaker of today's session thank you thank you sir thank you sir jagendra the respected uh, speaker of today sir dr rao vadlamudi sir colleagues principals of the various colleges and dear participants good morning to all of you and welcome to today's session by the rao vadlamudi sir it's my great privilege and honor i feel to introduce sir rao vadlamudi sir rao vadlamudi sir completed his bpharm in 1973 mpharm in 1976 in pharmaceutical chemistry in prestigious university andhra university visakhapatnam msc in 1980 phd in 1983 in pharmacology and toxicology the from the university of british columbia bangkok bc canada in 1984 rao vadlamudi started his career at udct mutanga mumbai and during a career spanning 35 years he worked in academia as well as in the pharma industry in various capacities academic position positions held by dr vadlamudi include reader in pharmacology udct udct professor in pharmacology bombay college of pharmacy bcp first ever director of bcp director of uh, st peter's institute of pharmaceutical sciences vadangar and adjunct professor acharya and bm reddy college of pharmacy bengaluru his industry career began in 1990 in the hest research center as head pharmacology he he was head pharmacology in the piramal research center vice president discovery biology human life sciences vice president principal fellow nectar therapeutics limited india india limited and senior vice president life sciences at vimta uh, labs limited hyderabad he was the editor of indian journal of pharmaceutical sciences the official scientific publication of the indian pharmaceutical association from 1996 to 2014 he served as the president of the indian pharmaceutical association for two terms that is 2014 to 16 and 2016 to 18 and during this period he was a member of a drug technical advisory board dtab of the ministry of health and family welfare government of india currently he is the president of the commonwealth pharmacist association cpa and a member of the governing body of the life sciences sector skill development council of india he is also the professional secretary of set form forum a forum of all the national pharmaceutical associations of southeast asia region countries he received the fellowship of indian pharmaceutical association in 2000 the dr p n ghosh memorial oration award of the indian pharmacological society in 2005 the professor m l korana memorial lecture award of ipa in 2009 the eminent pharmacist award of ipa in 2013 the ipa special oration award in 2014 the fellowship of the association of biotechnology and pharmacy in december 2014 and the acharya pc roy gold medal award in november 2019 with this brief the brief bio data we can very clearly understand a personality a distinguished personality with experience in academics in industry and also in different professional bodies and also responsible positions you know as a president of commonwealth as pharmacist association and also a, uh, you know as a president past president of the indian pharmacist association one of the one of the very big uh, professional body of india and also 
a professional secretary a serfarmer forum that is the a forum of fip that is international pharmaceutical federation and who with the national pharmaceutical association of the southeast asian region so this is what we understand is uh, with experience in academics experience in uh, uh, you know industries as a vice president level as a big position uh, having a lot of responsibilities and also very you know social responsible personality in uh, different professional uh, bodies and uh, present right now also is working for the good cause and uh, good uh, uh, you know for the good thing uh, for well being of this pharmacy profession it's our great fortunate to have sir ra vadlamodi with us and uh, we feel we feel very proud sir being you are the alumni of the andhra university being we are from the andhra university and uh, thank you very much sir for accepting our invitation and sensitizing the all the participants definitely all the participants will have the a great uh, experience of this your class and definitely they will get a memories and everyone will get benefit overall this pharmacy professional sir and uh, once again i welcome sir and uh, please proceed to thank you very much sir and please proceed to your lectures thank you uh, thank you jagdish uh, it's it's really thank you for your kind uh, you know introduction you spoke more than necessary of course you know i don't consider that i am not uh, consider that i am that big as you described what fundamentally uh, drives me is whether i can make a difference to someone who is associated with me whether that person is a student or a colleague or, or a coworker or um, you know a professional body so keep working at it such that at least i have the satisfaction that i am doing something for the profession whether it is appreciated by all or not it does not really matter you know uh thank you for inviting me to give this talk which is a, a very passionate talk for me uh, about scientific writing incidentally i spoke about the same topic last week in another webinar because people are asking me to give that talk and while discussing with dr panda he just mentioned to me that yesterday's talk was in the lines in a similar lines ethics in writing given by my very good friend you know bupinder bhu in fact some 10 years ago i gave a similar talk in punjab university when he invited me to give that so i have been talking about scientific writing all across the country i still continue to edit a uh, manuscript for indian journal of pharmaceutical sciences and it has really become a passion for me to talk about a subject that is very dear to me i can i i would be any time willing to talk there are many things that i would be saying today probably i have repeated several times in uh, on different platforms but one thing that is very clear to me is that whoever is listening to this talk whether they are listening for the first time or 10th time i really would like to understand how much do you get from this talk and how much do you really implement when you are writing a manuscript the the value addition or the the impact of this talk is actually an outcome of your scientific writing while i have uh, said this i must share my experience as uh, editor of indian journal of pharmaceutical sciences for almost 20 years as a editor and after that several more years as a advisory board member and continuously supporting the editing of that journal i can say that many people have not really implemented what they hear about this talk because i still continue to correct in manuscripts the same mistakes over and over again and again because people are not really realizing how a good manuscript has to be written now let let me take about an hour uh, approximately an hour to uh, or maybe a little bit more than that depending upon 
how deeply I go into each topic uh, about this uh, aspect of scientific writing. And I profusely thank the management of Raghu College of Pharmacy and my dear friend, uh, Principal Dr. Jagdish Panda, for giving me this opportunity to talk to you all. I would like to share my screen now. Um, yeah, I hope you all can see the screen and I'll go into um, the full screen mode. Okay. Um, so this is the topic is titled scientific writing for publishing an article in a journal. And see, before writing an article in a journal, we need to really consider what are the essentials of a publication. We, I have listed down these essentials here, but at the same time, I'm also trying to differentiate one publication from the other and you know, finally come down to what is exactly manuscript preparation. <clears throat> First and foremost, you need to have quality research work. So I'll be talking about a little bit about quality research work. You know, uh, research work is everybody does. Quality research work is only some people do. But everybody perceives that whatever they are doing is of quality. However, quality is not a perception. Quality is an actual measure of something we have done, you know. So therefore, I would talk a little bit about quality research work. Then several people would ask a question because I have been asked this question, you know, how do I choose the right journal? Where should I publish? Or why should I publish in this particular journal? Such questions would come. I would talk a little bit about that, you know, choice of a journal and how the journal matrices of uh, evaluating a journal, you know, actually work, followed by the importance of scientific communication. Now, publication or a research paper is one of the scientific communications. But how important it is to communicate science. Science in the sense what we are doing is research and we are communicating research as a part of science. However, there is another sort of communication which is teaching. What we read and learn out of literature and textbooks, we communicate. That, that's a different aspect. You know, I may not be talking much about communication and effective teaching. No, not here. You know, then when we plan to publish a quantum of research work, you know, a quantum of quality research work, then we need to look at whether that work is novel enough to attract a patent or it should go in a publication. Once we uh, boil down to all these, I mean, go through all these things, then what we require is actual manuscript preparation. So I have taken an example of how a manuscript can be divided into different chapters and how that can be published or how that can be prepared. And probably a chunk of this presentation is dedicated to that part. How do we do a manuscript preparation? And finally, a few words about proper scientific writing skills. That would be, uh, in a way, ties up this talk with what uh, Dr. Boop might have talked yesterday. Because I was told that he talked about ethics in writing and plagiarism. Proper scientific writing skills also comes into in the same arena that, you know, and what pushes people into plagiarism. You know, that maybe I will just conclude that by a few statements there. So research and design, you know, there, there, there are some aspects that I put here. Research should be what kind of a research it should be. Most of these transparencies that I prepared are an outcome of questions asked by various students or faculty or audience when I made the presentations. And then whenever there are uh, very, uh, you know, 
pointed questions, then I decide to add a slide in my presentation. Probably I would answer those questions first, uh, for, you know, right, right in the beginning itself, so that students or, you know, those people who are interested need not really be bogged down by a question in their mind. What is research? You know, research should be, it can be of different origins. One is pioneering. Pioneering means it is first time it's being done. It's a it's a novel idea for investigation. Nobody has done it done this before, or nobody has approached to this problem from this angle or from this perspective. But we never know whether something that we start doing is pioneering or not. So therefore, you do literature search. You have you get an idea, you do a literature search, whether anybody has worked in that particular area. Suppose if somebody has already worked in that particular area, if you work in the same area, then you are confirming or refuting that research, but not, but yours will not become pioneer. Sometimes you read literature without any idea. You read literature and suddenly when you read a research paper, a thought comes in, in your mind. Hey, how come they have looked at it from this angle, but when there is another angle, you know, which they have completely ignored, you know, then you start working on it. That is the idea that is generated solely by you. So therefore it becomes pioneering. So you have to develop a habit of reading literature and reflecting on it. It's very important to analytically think and reflect on that manuscript or that report or that conclusion by another set of researchers that you may suddenly start thinking in a novel idea, you know, from a novel point of view, and that could be pioneering. Or many a times when you do this research literature, I mean, uh, read research, then you find gaps. Then there is a flow and suddenly the, the, the entire field jumps into another conclusion, but leaving a huge gap. And you stumble on that gap and you say that, how come People have started analyzing and looking at from a different angle when they, there is an open arena here and they have not really looked at this point or they have not really looked at whether this could be true. That's actually research that is addressing gaps in literature. Now, my examples are so abstract that, you know, it's it very in, um, you know, very hypothetical. The simple reason is that I cannot give you examples. Everywhere I have to dwell deep into the into a research subject in order to point out a gap in literature and which takes a lot of time. You know. So therefore, I'm not going to say that, but I suffice it by saying that when you read literature, when you analyze manuscripts, so it is very important. And the third type of research is often when you are reading literature, you come across a set of manuscripts, set of authors, a school of thought. That's what we say. One school of thought is saying that a particular thing happens in a particular way. And another school of thought is that a particular thing happens, but not in the way that those people have reported, but in a different way. You, you would find this kind of argumentative or contradicting views in the literature. Now, as a researcher, when you are looking at that from a very impartial, unbiased perspective, you don't know whether to agree with this school of thought or with the other school of thought. And that is when you don't have to side anybody without evidence from your end. So you start doing research, designing experiments to address those controversies. You may come up with a third hypothesis, third theory, or you may agree with one and disagree with the other. Okay, that is how you know research progresses. So all this thought process would give rise to a research idea, which can be developed into a research project. And usually, that research project should be developed and it is of quality. Now, here we bring the term quality. I, in the next slide, I will be describing what are the determinants of quality in research. Okay. Uh, there is one point that I want to mention here, 
is very essential is that well designed and well executed research well designed research projects and well executed research projects can be written into a good publication with ease now why that happens is because everything is proper everything is in order so you just can write up a manuscript very easily so initial groundwork to write a good manuscript or good publication is a well designed and well executed research project what are the metrics what are the qualities that determine quality okay there are some foundations based on which quality research can be built the foundation can be simply defined as knowledge practice and ethics now pharmaceutical sciences is a applied research area it is not pure research it is a applied research area that means you have to borrow from so many basic sciences you know when we are doing chemistry synthesis we borrow from organic chemistry physical chemistry quantum mechanics and all that you know however when we do medicinal chemistry the objective of, of the product is that it should be a therapeutic agent or it should be a pharmacologically active agent so therefore we need to understand how that pharmacologically active agent should work on a microorganism or on a disease you know on a target or on a organ tissue then we need to understand the physiology and pharmacology and receptors and kinetics and and molecular biology and also pathogenesis and some kind of you know pathogenic mechanisms etc in order to design right and test the designed molecule right so therefore there is so many basic science information knowledge is necessary before we can do very effective medicinal chemistry research that is the knowledge that is necessary if you, if if a researcher doesn't have that knowledge or doesn't have knowledge of understanding of certain basic sciences that are that play a key role in the success of this research what takes a hit is quality takes a hit so i'm just trying to say that whatever you do you need to understand all the basic sciences that are there you know when you are doing a distillation you see it is physical uh, physical pharmacy or physical chemistry that comes into picture you know so you need to understand all that you need to understand well enough to be not making very obvious mistakes that's what my my mean uh, my point is. if you start making mistakes in research then the research loses quality practice is as research is not just reading and speculating and writing down on a piece of paper or designing equations or anything you need to have an understanding of how well you can do that technique and practice makes the technique perfect so therefore good research is entirely based on how well versed you are with the methodologies that you employ in executing that research and those methodologies can be you are well versed in those methodologies only if you have a lot of practice on that you know only with practice you build your core competency or a core capability the other day i have given an example i think i will give the same example if you just learned driving and you start driving a car on the road with lot of mistakes and with many a times the car stalls and then goes this way that way because you are still not very good you can you can tell somebody that i know driving but not well enough to drive safely you know so the quality in driving comes when you can drive safely and you can drive with confidence without causing any perturbance to either the people who are on the road or the people sitting in the car that comes out of only practice several hours of driving experience so that means if driving is a research the quality of driving or research is based on how well you have practiced you know without practice if people jump into an experiment and do it for the first time and expect a quality outcome to come it won't come 
let me honestly tell you because when you do an experiment for the first time, you don't know whether it worked or not. If your experiment did not work and you thought it worked, then the outcome cannot be quality driven. That's what I meant. Now, ethics is integrity of an individual, it's a personal integrity and it is sincerity. What we're talking about, if something doesn't work, you know, in a research, then you have to have, uh, have the guts to say that it did not work, you know. You must also have the, uh, what you call, zeal or interest to figure out whether it is worked or not. It is simply presuming that it worked and stating that the experiment worked without without making enough, um, you know, enough, uh, what do you call, enough investigation or without having enough evidence that the experiment or the, the equipment or the process worked, you know, it becomes, if you report like that, it becomes unethical. You know, what, what we talk, the, the pharmaceutical industry currently is facing a regulatory compliance issues and many a times people would question that, you know, are you using quality as a culture? Have you developed quality culture? They would ask that. So if, if a person has not developed quality culture and says that, no, 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 everything we have done is of high quality, you know, we will not come down on quality and zero tolerance we have without that quality culture, then whatever you are stating is not ethical. That's, that's what I really meant, you know. So. It, it, it takes a lot of integrity and ethics. So good research or quality research has these foundations. You should have knowledge enough. You should have practice or core capabilities adequate to perform the knowledge and I mean, perform the research and then the ethics to say that whether things have worked or not, whether things were done properly or not. If you are doubtful about the proper working, you should say that I am doubtful about this equipment working, so therefore the research I have done need not necessarily be very accurate. An ethical person would say that. Okay, in the same um, line, quality is decided by essential entities of quality research. The, those are the foundations and these are the entities. Is, this is mostly the designing aspects of the and, and executional aspects of the research, you know. Whether the research project that you have chosen has relevance, that's the correct context. Whether the stra strategy of doing that research is correct. Whether the methodology you have employed are the exact methods necessary to give you results that would take you in the direction of your research hypothesis or research objective. Sometimes you can use the wrong method and it doesn't work, you know, and then the outcomes, the data, whether the data is properly interpreted and the interp properly interpreted data has the expected outcome or impact on science. These are all essentials. You know, why I'm saying is that, but mind you, I can talk for hours on all these aspects in a separate seminar. The reason is many a times a out of context research done without a proper strategy, executed without with wrong methodologies and processes and, and data wrongly interpreted would not give the, the intended impact on the outcome, I mean, um, on, on science, on, on uh, understanding of the science. You know, a great example comes from drug discovery research, you know, the research area where I spent almost 20 years of my life. If you have not chosen the right disease, right disease target and did not choose the right animal models or, you know, screening models, and you continue to perform, you know, volumes of research, uh, identify molecules and develop them, they all fail at some place because nothing is right in your strategy, in your approach that the intended impact of creating an effective clinical compound for treating the disease would never arise, you know, would never, uh, that will not be the outcome. That's what I'm trying to say. So these essential entities have to be applied to each research project to see whether you are, you, your research is being designed in the right direction. I, I don't want to dwell further into it because this is 
everything related to quality of research. So from the quality of research, when you execute quality of research, then the outcome would give rise to a quality publication. Now, let's say that everything is done right and then you, you need to publish and then you have to choose a journal to publish, you know, and which is the journal that you would like to publish. The wish list is a reputed peer reviewed international journal with a high impact factor. Everybody thinks about I want to publish in a peer reviewed international journal with high impact factor. OK, now in that particular one, uh, there are a few questions. You know, what is meant by peer reviewed? What is meant by international? What's meant by high impact factor? Because you can always ask these questions. You know, what is this? What is this? What is this? Now, let me first answer what is a national and an international journal? Conventionally, national journals mean those journals that are managed by national associations. Okay, mostly journals are run by associations, like a chemistry, chemical association would run Journal of Chemistry, or a physics association would run a Journal of Physics. You know, pharmaceutical association runs Journal of Pharmaceutical Sciences. So Indian Pharmaceutical Association runs Indian Journal of Pharmaceutical Sciences. Since these associations are national in nature, their journals predominantly are platforms for research in those areas within that country for publishing. So this is what the point is. So Indian Journal of Pharmaceutical Sciences predominantly publishes research done in Indian pharmaceutical sciences schools as well as Indian industry or the research centers. Nevertheless, uh, so from the same direct, um, from the same uh, definition, international journals are those journals which are organized by, which are managed by, which are published by international organizations. So you can consider FIP and there are some international, international society for heart research and international IUPAC, international, um, you know, uh, society for pharmacology and therapeutics. There are so many international societies that I can think of. And their journals are not pertaining to a particular country. They are published from somewhere. And then they attract publications from all the member countries or member, uh, members of those associations. So the publications come from different uh, uh, origins, different countries. So therefore, the journal's nature becomes international. The other way of people think about national and international is by looking at the names Indian Journal, American Journal, British Journal, you know, all are national because they, the name indicates that either it is from India or from Japan or Russia, I mean, or America or Canada or, or UK. That's another way. So a, a, an international journal is referred to as international journal. You know. So for example, some journals are there that doesn't have anything on that. You know, it is neither a journal labeled after a country or international. Say, for example, science, nature. What are these? These are international publications. The simple because nature, nature publishes all, you know, papers from all over the world. Science publishes papers from all over the world. So these are the differences. However, please remember, if a journal is called International Journal of Pharmaceutical Sciences because it is titled as international and published from some local platform, some pharmacy college or some publisher in India, in Bombay or Gurgaon, it doesn't become international. So the name doesn't mean that it becomes international. National journals are those that publish manuscripts that are predominantly belonging to, to that nation and internationally when the publications come from all over the world. Indian Journal of Pharmaceutical Sciences, after it became online, the number of publications from foreign authors is increasing. So today, Indian Journal of Pharmaceutical Sciences publishes almost 30 to 35 percent of papers from foreign authors, from the, the work done, by, done in foreign countries. Then it is becoming truly an international journal by nature. We don't wish that to be international journal. We still want it to be Indian Journal of Pharmaceutical Sciences only. But it, it is international in nature because 30 to 35 percent of the manuscripts but published in that in the journal are from foreign authors, are from foreign authors. This is how we can 
differentiate. So it doesn't really matter whether you would like to publish in a national journal or international journal. Most of the journals have international circulation today because they are online. Now, impact factors. You know, what are these impact factors? Nowadays, you see several impact factors. But the real true impact factor is JCR impact factor. It's the general citation registry giving impact factor. And an impact factor is nothing but a measure of how many papers are cited in a given, in a unit period of time out of the unit period, uh, I mean, unit number of, you know, citable manuscripts that are published in a journal usually it is the impact factors are per year or per a period of two years or per a period of three years so let us say for example in a if a journal publishes 100 manuscripts in a year and if these 100 manuscripts in the following year because when they are being published in a year some are published in January, some are published in March, some are published in July, and some are published in December. So all of these manuscripts that are published in one year, now the unit is that during the next year, following year, that is how it is calculated, but there are multiple ways of calculating it. But for simply for people to understand, if they receive 1,000 citations, the next year let us say so papers published in a year in a year's time if they receive thousand then and if the papers are hundred that are published then the impact factor becomes thousand by hundred ten the simplest calculation let me put it this way but that doesn't mean that each and every individual manuscript or paper published has received more than 10 citations in a year no out of these there may be one or two manuscripts or pub publications which are highly cited and some might not have been cited so it is an average index it's an index for the journal so if somebody is publishing in a journal with a high impact factor it is only an index that this paper got published in a journal that has high citation index that's all it doesn't mean that this manuscript is getting that many citations. It is not an individual metric. It is a generalized metric. So if a high impact factor journal is of higher quality and if your paper gets accepted into a higher quality journal, it doesn't mean that it, it means that your paper is of the quality to be accepted by a journal of high impact factor. That, that is what it is. But let me tell you, all, all of you, who are beginners and writing papers for the first time, you can't expect that your first time attempted manuscript be published in a high impact factor journal. But it can be provided you have written it in a proper way. So it is possible provided you write a very good manuscript based on a very good research, quality research executed perfectly. There are other general indicators also. I want to mention those things also. There's also SGR indicator, SJR indicator. SJR indicator, which is called SJR, you know, um, like impact factor, SJR impact factor, is a little different from JCR impact factor. In SJR, all the citations received by these manuscripts over a period of one year, all of them will not be considered. Only those that are cited by journals of reputed journals of higher um, you know, impact will be only considered. So if a if an unknown journal cited some manuscript five, six different times, it is not considered. But in the impact factor, in the, in the JCR impact factor, it is considered. In the SJR factor, it's not considered. That's what. So SJR fa uh, factor is a little lower than the JCR impact factor, but it is of higher quality. That's what they think. It's only for us to understand, you know, really not that they have a huge, huge impact. There is one more thing called H index. H index is usually an author level index. So if I have published 100 papers, let's say, and if my high H index is 10, 
that really means that out of my 100 papers, only 10 papers are cited 10 times or more. The rest of the papers are cited lower than 10 times. That's what it means. So authors who have published many, many, many manuscripts, many, many papers, their quality can be decided by what is their H index. The same metrics can be used for journals also. And sometimes in journals, what happens see, earlier during impact factor, I mentioned to you something that if 10 is the impact factor of a journal and if 100 papers are published in that, that means 1000 times they are cited. It doesn't mean that all the papers are cited more than 10 times or 10 times at least. That's not it means. There may be two papers who are cited 600 times, four papers which are about 200 times, and there may be 50 papers which have not been cited at all, right? So how do we differentiate that? So the H-index of a journal indicates that among the number of papers that are published in a year, how many papers have been actually uh, cited more than a particular number of times? So the hitch index is, if it is Y, then it means Y publications have at least been cited Y times. So if a, if a, if a journal is publishing 100 or 200 articles, let's say 100 articles, if its hitch index is 25, it means that 25 of those papers were cited more than 25 times. That is another quality index. Now I can, uh, I'll show you the quality index of Indian Journal of Pharmaceutical Sciences, how it would come. Uh, where is that slide? Yeah, here it is, you know. With the latest citations, you know, 2018 JCR impact factor is 0 0.634, okay. This impact factor keeps varying between 0.7 to 0.5, and it keeps going up and down. You know, the highest we got is 0.737, and now it is 0.634. SJR indicator, as I said, it is much more quality driven. All the citations are not taken into picture. Only citations in reputed journals will take it into picture. So it is 0.21. But one thing that really surprises me and then also makes me feel proud of the journal is H-index. H index is 54. Now, Indian Journal of Pharmaceutical Sciences in a year publishes about 130 manuscripts, not more than that, six issues and 20 to 25 it publishes per issue. So it is anywhere between 120 to 150 manuscripts. On the average, it works out to be about 130, 130 140. Hitch index is 54 this year means that 54 of that manuscripts have been cited 54 times or more, you know, so that means they are really, really getting cited. Okay, so that makes uh, on Hitch index based alone, IJPS is ranked number one in India, third in Asia and 49th in the world. Uh, and we also receive very high number 1500 papers and then many of them are rejected right in the beginning because they are either not meeting the requirement of the journal or plagiarized or not of quality or the subject is not related to pharmaceutical sciences. After all that, about 150, 160 or about 200 manuscripts are sent to reviewers for peer review process and out of which about 130 papers are published. You know, average lag time for six months. This is how you have to really evaluate a journal. Okay, now let's go back and look at what kind of other journals that we have. There's also some journals called rapidly publishing journals. And you should be aware of predatory journals. Now, some people would say that, oh, that's a predatory journal. Don't publish it in that. Rapidly publishing journals are those that announce and say that we are publishing manuscripts and people would send them and within two weeks or within 10 days, they are accepted and published. Really, these are not quality journals at all. You know, a rapid public, if you receive, as an editor, I know if I receive 20 papers and to in order, if I evaluate all the 20 papers to see if they are, first of all, meeting the journal requirements for consideration 
who sent it to a review, for me, all those 20 papers would take at least 10 days to evaluate because I can only evaluate two or three manuscripts per day. And if I have 10 people to do it, then it can be done in two days. But when I have 10 people, all the 10 need not be looking at manuscripts with the same criteria. So again, we have to relook at and if some criteria are ignored, all that. So initial screening itself would take a lot of time. Then it goes to reviewers and reviewers take their own time. And after reviewers recommend, it comes back and the editorial team has to look at those journals again, look at those manuscripts again. Whether the reviewer has rejected it or whether the reviewer has suggested some changes and then it has to be sent to author. Author makes the changes and it comes back and the editor finally evaluates and publishes. All this would take at least three to four months time, even if you get about 20, 30 manuscripts. So this rapid publishing within one week, two days, you know, 10 days is not possible because nobody is prepared to do that kind of work. Except some very, very prestigious um, publishing houses are journals like Tetrahedron Letters and, you know, uh, there are some biophysical and bio chemical BBA, you know, is another one, you know, biophysical and biochemical. Um, what is BBA stands for? I, I even forgot, you know. Uh, there are some very rapid publishing journals which are of very, very, very high quality. There, when, when they receive a communication, they send it to a scientist and overnight he would evaluate it, you know, and send it back because they maintain that, rig that rigor and rapidity in such journals. Tetrahedron Letters is a great example of that. Nevertheless, all the rest are just receiving and publishing, receiving and publishing, receiving and publishing. You know, that rapid publishing, there is, so there is no review, there is no editing. And if such journals also charge for the publication, that means they, they take money saying that we would provide editorial services, but do not provide any such services and publish, then these journals are called predatory journals. That's the only difference. The other type of journals that you may be looking at are something called open access journal and pay to view journals or pay to read journals. Now, open access journals, usually they put their published manuscripts in open public domain because they believe that Science should be communicated to other scientists and other scientists need not pay for that. Probably open access journals would charge from the author for, for their sustenance. You know, even IJPS does do charge at the end, uh, you know, a levy from, uh, you know, from the authors whose manuscripts are accepted for publication. Not charging when there is a submission, no not charging when we evaluate the manuscript no only when it is getting published final stage so that means only those final manuscripts the 130 140 i said we charge a nominal fee maybe up to thousand rupees or not even thousand rupees just to overcome the expenses but you know closer journals science direct journals etc if you look at them if you want a PDF out of that, you have to pay $60, $25, $10. That means they make money out of the scientists, you know, who is willing to read that. People talk about ethics on this platform and really I'm not really comfortable because if you are a, a student and want to read good work and if you have to pay 10 to 20 to $30 per each quality manuscript published in Science Direct for PDFs, you know, sometimes that's just not uh, good practice at all. So you, your science is coming at a cost to you. you know? So that's, that's a different philosophy altogether. So let me move out of this very quickly. Um, so you choose a journal based on whether it, it publishes manuscripts in your area, whether it is well read, whether it has a good circulation or do you feel loyal about publishing in Indian Journal of Pharmaceutical Sciences being or any Indian Journal of Pharmacology or Indian Journal of Pharmaceutical Education and Research because you are Indian, you need to publish in India, Indian Journal. All those things can be 
drivers for choosing the journal. OK, now choosing a journal to publish, that's over. Whatever, whenever you choose a journal to publish, first read the instructions to authors of the journal and prepare a manuscript according to that. It is absolutely essential because any editor who is considering a manuscript would like the author to prepare articles for that journal exclusively. As an editor, I want all those authors who wishes to publish, who wish to publish in IJPS, must read the instructions to authors of how to prepare manuscripts and prepare a manuscript that is meeting all the requirements in the journal, in the instructions to authors. Then when I look at the manuscript, I know that, oh, this person has prepared it with the intention to publish in IJPS. Suppose if I receive a manuscript and which is not at all meeting any requirements, then I would simply say that well, this guy doesn't even know what journal he is writing and he just wrote something and expect the editor or editorial team to convert it into the journal format. Please remember, editorial team doesn't want to convert the manuscripts to the journal format because if I have to do that, I have to do it to 1500 submissions. Right? If an author sends five papers in a year and the editor receives 1500, if an author has to convert these manuscripts to, a, you know, to the journal style, he has to do only for five papers. And if editor has to do, he has to do for 1500 papers. You know, how is that possible? So it is absolutely the author's responsibility. That is why different journals have different styles of writing. And then they, they suggest that in their instructions to authors because they want you to write exclusively to that journal. That means you care for the journal, you prepare manuscripts according to the journal style and format and submit. That's what is needed. You know, This is the bottom line of that, choosing a journal to publish. Whatever journal you choose, you read the instructions to authors and you prepare the manuscript as per that. Why do we need to do communication of science? You know, it's very simple. If you have done a very good research and keep it with you, nobody will know. So your research must be communicated. And that communication is either oral or written. So first we all present a seminar or make a oral presentation or a poster presentation where you speak about your work. So first of all, we have to have good speaking skills, expression skills in order to express what research you have done, why you have done it, how you have done it, and what are the results and what those results exactly tell. But ultimately, what those results exactly tell is your own interpretations that you are expressing to the scientific community that they can understand from your perspective. This is very important because here science is communicated, good science is communicated from the person who executed that, the scientist, and from his perspective. That's why you require that communication capability. So initially you get that communication capability by making oral presentations, by giving a seminar. And that would provide you the platform that is necessary to write. Okay. How do you write? How do you write a sentence? You have to think about the sentence in the mind. And then put it down in writing. Many a times people would say that sentence loud. And then keep writing. So that means any written communication is coming out of, first of all, you have to think about that. Oh, this is how I want to write. Over a period of time, it becomes so automatic that you won't be saying it, but writing it. Okay. So initially, you need good oral communication skills, ability to form sentences, ability to express what your thoughts, because in oral communication, you're not really bothered about grammar and placing the right word before or after a verb or whether to put a verb or adjective before or after, you know, you would be saying those things. But when you write, 
you have to put it in the right place if you don't put all those in the right places the sentences mean differently right in a oral communication if you have said something and to a person it sounded different he would raise a hand and say that what did what did you say what exactly you mean then you have an opportunity to say that again to convince him that this is what you mean but in writing when once you have done it and you have interpreted it wrongly it is perceived by everybody wrongly you know so therefore you have to have good communication skills oral and then you have to convert them into good writing skills and written up uh, communications are like patents versus publications research papers short and rapid communications and reviews you know sorry uh, rapid communications and reviews it's not it's the same sentence research papers follow comma short or rapid communications and reviews reports this and dissertation all these things are written communication we, we talk about how a manuscript has to be prepared before that i just want to mention a little things about patent versus publication if you have done pioneering type of research and that is the research of first of its kind and it is patentable then you should patent it first rather than publishing it patenting it is you are explaining to the world what is your thought and what is the art of invention and that invention how it is invented or how it is prepared and what is it and what are the various forms of that and what uses it can be you know subjected to all that you would write as claims of the product or the process that you are patenting and that is protected when patent is granted the patent goes into public domain but it is protected for you people can read your patent but they know that they can read and say this this work and this product and this process and and all these uses of this have already been patented by somebody so i cannot use it that is the objective of that patent or that kind of publication so it is either a product patent or a process patent or application or use patent you know patent writing is a different art because it's also legal language somebody has to use so let's not get further into it on the other hand publication is you designed an experiment and you executed that and there is some result came and then there is a reason why you have designed that experiment so you explain that and put it in public domain for people to understand and for people to design their experiments their research based on what you have found or what you have reported that's not protected by you so anybody can use that method use that product use that outcome and do further research on that okay and it would be commented criticized by other people and then people may produce manuscripts which are either agreeing with you or refuting with you and there can be debates about it but this is publications for open discussion across the scientific community all over the world right what is the difference patent is also a publication a open publication a manuscript i mean a research publication is also a publication you are the author for both in one case you can protect it you are the inventor and if you can commercially exploit that you can get lot of money or if you can sell that you can also get money if you are in a publication if you publish a good paper you are an author you are regarded as a scientist par excellence people several people mold their research after you they would regard you as a stalwart or a doyen, doyen in that particular area you get lot of recognition scientific satisfaction but probably there is no money in that this is the two differences between patents and publications now let's get into manuscript preparation you know you all are aware that a good research and ability to write a manuscript would give you a manuscript 
and the manuscript what i mean by manuscript the manuscript is a written draft prepared for publication so if you written if you type write in a4 pages or something some 30 pages that's called a manuscript for publication when you submit it for publication then that is manuscript under consideration when it is accepted and a it starts appearing on the on the online or internet platform as a PDF, as you know, articles and the publication of articles in press, then that is called a preprint. Okay. When finally it is put in a volume of an issue and then given page numbers, volume number, and issue number, and published online as well as the print version, it is a published manuscript. So these are the differences. Manuscript, sub manuscript submitted, manuscript accepted, manuscript in preprint form, and research publication, you know, PDF, whatever. The research publications usually are divided into these chapters like abstract, introduction, materials, methods, results, and discussion, references, figures, and tables. Okay. Now, research papers are we call them full research papers they represent an entire complete well-designed study when you write a manuscript you have to use a simple reported speech everything has to be written in the past tense because the research has already been done and you are reporting what has been done you're reporting what you what you thought of doing, what you have done, what you have observed, and how you interpreted, and what the results would, you know, say, or how it can be implemented, interpreted, and what impact they make. Everything in past tense and reported speech. This is very important. And whenever you quote, cite <laughs> from another manuscript, another reported publication, you ensure that you give them a citation, but do not copy from the manuscript or from, from the research publication that's already been published verbatim. Verbatim means word to word. Then it would come under plagiarism. So plagiarism has a definition. If you have reported a man, if you cite a manuscript, uh, I would keep on saying manuscript. I mean, if you cite a published paper you give their citation and then give their reference in the reference bibliography or references chapter but you are supposed to write in your own words what those authors have reported not in their words suppose if you copy a paragraph from that manuscript or from that research paper and say that these authors have reported and use the exact paragraph as they have written and give them a citation, it is still plagiarized. Several people raise a question, how we have cited them, we have given them credit. You have given them credit, but you have used their own language, not your language. That is copy-pasting. Copy-pasting is plagiarism. If you copy-paste, if you want to use their words verbatim, then you have to put these that sentence under quote unquote marks. So that means whatever you are citing verbatim should come under quotation, under quotation marks. In a manuscript, if you have several paragraphs like that under quotation marks, what is meant by things that are in between quote, open quote and close quote is that those are not your words, somebody else's words. That's what you are saying. If you have too much of that, such quote unquote paragraphs in your manuscript, then your originality come count comes down. That means your manuscript is not original, but it is borrowed from somebody. It is reporting or it is, uh, you know, stating verbatim what others have stated. Then it fails to be your own, you know. And if it has too much of a uh, quote unquote marks, then it becomes a copyright issue. So your scientific paper has to be written in your own words in your own sentences. That's what is simple. 
when you do not use your own words, your own sentences, but copy somebody else's, it becomes plagiarized. That's as simple as that. Now, let, let me you know, explain to you a few things that come in a manuscript. You know, I have seen that several people are confused about this. Title. Title of a manuscript is very important. Title of your research paper is very important. But it should not be full-length sentences. It has to be short and precise, but at the same time, indicate your entire research or entire uh, paper in which your research you are, you know, trying to communicate. It's very important. It can be a little lengthy, maybe two lines, not more than that, you know. Uh, something like 20 words, you know, 20 to 25, even 25 is too long. It need not be a complete sentences, you know. So it, it can be phrases and put in such a way that, you know, synthesis and antibacterial activity of so and so, you know. But some people would say, you know, Synthesis and antibacterial activity of substituted charcoals prepared using nickel as a catalyst. I mean, you don't have to go into that detail because that, is, that detail is already in there in your manuscript. But you have to see that what is the focus of your manuscript? Is synthesis is the focus or evaluation is the focus or use of a novel method for synthesis is the focus? Based on that, your title has to be drafted to show the the readers what is the focus if it is, it is a different method for synthesis is the focus then screening of those molecules is not important they can remaining remain in the manuscript but they need not be in the title but synthesis is routine but screening is important then it becomes synthesis and evaluation of antibacterial activity of because the evaluation of antibacterial activity has become very important because that is the focus. So like that, the title has to show the focus of the manuscript. And then there should be a short running title because if the manuscript, if the paper runs into six or seven pages, then on the first page, the title will be there. And each page in the footer, a running title will be there. That running title with the author's name is the indicator of this page belongs to that paper. Uh, uh, you know, that that's how the short running title is necessary. Author's names, very important. Only people who are involved in the investigation should be authors. They have to take a role in the investigation, in the research. Advisors and who help you a little bit here and there, or who, who said hello to you, or who lent his equipment uh, you, you use it somebody else's HPLC, uh, but only used his HPLC, but nothing else, you know. And just for lending HPLC, you should not give authorship to that person, you know. You have to write in acknowledgement that I acknowledge Professor so and so for allowing me to use the facility, right? And if the manuscript, if the authors, if this is, let's say, your research supervisor, you and maybe one or two co-workers who supported you during, you know, performing certain activities, you know, uh, that may be three authors or four authors. And if your supervisor is not head of the department, if your supervisor is not the principal, then you need not give head HOD and principal and chairman of the institution uh, and, and uh, uh, vice chancellor of the university authorships. No, it's not necessary because the the responsibility of the principals or management is to provide facilities for doing research because that is their contract. They agreed for that. They need not get authorship because of that. But I see several people put all those people as authors. That's diluting your authorship. Authors should be actual authors. First author is the person who has done the work and oftentimes written the paper. Middle authors or co-authors are contributed to the work. And last author is the supervisor who supervised that provided all facilities and direction 
guidance for the research. This is very well accepted norm all over the world. You suppose you have completed your work, you left and your professor wrote that manuscript, he may become the first author because he has written the manuscript. So first author is usually the person who executed the work as well as the person who has written the manuscript. Remember that, you know, and most often time, if it's a master's or a PhD student, the student is the person who executed as well as he is the writer, you know. Supervisor should not be first author when he has not written anything. But supervisor can be first author if he has written the manuscript. So these are the rules that are world over accepted and followed. The address that you give, the place of work, it's not the place where first author or middle author or the last author is currently. That's not important. If you have executed the work while, while working in a particular institution, let's say institution A, the address of the work or the manuscript or the research paper should be A only. Subsequently, the first author moved to institution B and wants to put that institution B in the main address of the manuscript. That is not correct because you are attributing work done to the laboratories of that institute, you know, where the laboratories have not contributed to the work. So you should not put that. But if you are, as an author, right, right now in that this thing, in that uh, institution, there is a footnote saying that the author currently is a professor in this institution. That's how it can be written. You know, but not put in the uh, give the address. You know, in in the um, in the main under main authors. Uh, then that's a title page. Then you come to abstracts and keywords. Abstracts are short. They should only state the objective, rationale, methodology, results, and conclusions. Very short. You know, you don't even have to write, you don't have to introduce the topic. You can straight away start abstract by saying the objective of this investigation is to evaluate, blah, blah, blah. You know, and we use this methodology and that methodology has yielded these results, and these results uh, can be, you know, concluded as these particular impacts. And if at all it has some funding, some, sometimes you put acknowledgement to that funding, you know. But in a research paper abstract, that acknowledgement to funding should come towards the end because, you know, there is there is a spot where you can write acknowledge funding from various sources. Every manuscript, whether it is a research paper or a short communication or a review article, they all should, can have, must have abstracts. Remember, abstract is the one that gets into all databases. So people who are searching for literature, when, when certain keywords, you know, bring out various publications, people get to read only abstract. So in your abstract, if you write about, uh, the introduction and you worked on a plant then about the beauty of that plant then people are not interested in that you know what you have actually done on that plant is more interesting than what was known about the plant anyway in your introduction you can write about that so in your abstract you need not in the abstract you must focus only what you have done and what is the impact of this manuscript or this uh, research investigation that should be there in the abstract and keywords should be a choice of keywords that are capable of you know picking out your abstract from the databases so keyword should be more than the title keyword should be more depicting or more uh, representing your research work as i said your title is only a focus of the research but you have used certain other aspects which when you want to evaluate uh, when when you want to search in the literature, you want your paper to surface, then such keywords you have to give. Um, it's a general term terminology that I cannot really describe what kind of a keywords, but if I look at a um, an article, look at a title, then I can design the keywords out of my experience. So everybody should be able to pick out a few keywords out of their entire manuscript and list them out. 
introduction is the most important aspect of the manuscript because you are introducing the concept why you have done this so you only cite the background as much as it is needed it should not be boring and long you know at the same time it should not be too short and uninformative so you have to really correctly you know write the introduction the introduction should be in such a way that you introduce the topic and you tell what is relevant and what is not known and how that would lead to the current investigation that's very important that tying up should be there you know if we have synthesized a molecule why you synthesize the molecule and what for and if you have used a plant then why that plant and what for and what was not known about the plant that you want to unravel now you know like that it has to flow more than this we cannot tell you how the introduction should be written because each introduction differs from manuscript to manuscript actually students or researchers must show their individuality and their unique way of thinking right in the introduction itself and the introduction must also later on pave way into discussing the results because introduction would end as what is the primary objective that you want to fulfill by performing this research and then how you have performed the research would be methods and what results were obtained would be results and how those results based on what you proposed initially can be interpreted as contributing and which way they are contributing to the science which way they contribute to the um, understand current understanding of that field of science is that's how you end up in uh, you know you conclude in your discussion so it all should be flowing but properly separated at different part with subtitles like introduction leading to materials and methods and what materials you have used what methods you have used here you really really have to see that what are important materials and important methods you know every trivial one that is known should not be listed but what is very critical for the met for the investigation or for the research must be mentioned if you skip the critical ones nobody will be able to reproduce your results nobody will be able to follow your methods and come to the same conclusion or get the same type of results therefore it is absolutely essential for you to write your methods in a very proper way you know what do i mean by trivial is you don't have to tell how a 10% solution is prepared you, know. you simply say ammonium chloride 10% solution was prepared in double distilled water you know when you make that sentence what is emphasis there is the double distilled water is very essential you know or if you say that certain such a solution is prepared in anhydrous you know solvent then the importance is that anhydrous so if you use a hydrated or non anhydrous or you know solvents containing water molecules then the solution formed need not necessarily give the chemical reaction that it is expected to because the water molecules or moisture is going to spoil it so that is what is important but if you say oh i dissolve i weigh 10 grams in a double beam uh, you know balance or or uh, electronic balance sartorius and dissolved in you know 100 liter 100 ml of water in a 100 ml volumetric flask and made up the volume to the neck to the mark to produce a 10% solution sorry that detail is should not be given in the methods at all because that is very trivial and people should know how a 10% solution can be made okay then followed by you go and then you discuss about your statistical methods and the level of significance chosen and if you chose a level of significance p less than or equal to 0.05 all results must be expressed at that significance level only now suddenly people would think that oh this result is highly significant now i can use p less than 0.01 so from 95% you are going to 99% that 
that is statistically unethical because if your result this particular result is statistically significant at point oh one percent but other result is not so comparatively when this result is significant the other is insignificant not statistically significant different but you say oh, no 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 sir but my level of significance is point zero zero five so therefore that is significant and this is more significant there is nothing called more significant less significant statistics has only two either statistically significant or not significant at a level of significance chosen so therefore please remember this if you choose point 0 0.05 then all the results must be compared whether they are statistically significant or not significant at that level of significance you cannot change up your level of significance from one experiment to the other experiment which is unethical you know that should be followed some journals are very picky on that some journals don't so people would think that oh it's you can interpret it that way but statistics say experimental statistics say you have to choose your level of significance a priori that means before the experiment and not change it posteriori that means after the experiment you need not change it so these are some you know rigid systems that you follow based on you know the journal requirements ethics committee approvals for animal experiments and clinical studies must be stated otherwise they are deemed to be performed without ethical clearances so you have to state that results and discussion so you you tabulate all your results and you try to present them either a tabular form or, or a graphical form or a bar diagram or a pie diagram whichever whichever helps you to interpret your result best. But you need not present tables and graphs containing the same tabular data or bar diagrams with the same tabular data. No, there is no need of re, you know, uh, showing the same data in one form to another form to another form. There is only one way, either a table or a figure. And results that are not significant, there is no need to show them. You can write in the text saying that this particular result was, um, the results of this experiment indicated that these molecules do not possess that activity. So therefore, that data is not shown. But on the other hand, nowadays I see that a table full of data and only one row is significant and the rest of the rows is not significant, not significant. So that means inactive. Why are we presenting so much data that is indicating that it is either not active or not significant? <laughs> Why we don't want all the data to be published in manuscripts or in journals is that they use a lot of publication space. Each, the page size increases, the number of pages increases. Number of pages means, please remember, the cost increases for printing or even uh, web hosting because the PDF file becomes larger and PDF making charges increase. So therefore you have to publish only what is significant and what is relevant to your subsequent interpretation. Okay. So that is how you make your results and then you discuss the results. A simple description of the results is not discussion. You know, if you say that According to the table, if you see treatment has increased blood glucose levels at three days and at five days, the blood glucose level is still up, but at 10 days, it has come down. That is the description of the result. You have not discussed that result at all. So therefore, remember, description of the results and discussion are very different. And in the description of the result, you describe what is significantly different. And at times, you also describe what is not showing any effect. And in the discussion, you don't talk about what is not showing any effect, you know, but show the impact of the significant results on your understanding or how it enhances general understanding. This is how the discussion has to be written. Discussion has a lot more speculative, a lot more interpretation from your own perspective, such that you as a scientist start expressing your thoughts and your understanding of these results in your own words. That is very important for others to understand how science in your own words is 
your research is contributing to you know enhancement or upgrading or uplifting or you know increasing the horizons of science you know this is the term that is used uh, at this particular point i really want to tell you uh, okay discussion also requires you know um, whether the results are expected if they are expected how the expected results coming the way has an impact and suppose if the results are coming in an unexpected way then you have to explain why it is unexpected if they are not agreeing with what is already been published in literature then you have to explain why they are not you simply say that oh everybody says this but i am saying this that's it you cannot end like that <laughs> and then that type of discussion would also result in pointing out whether such results are reported for the first time so you have to say that because nobody else is going to look at your research and do all the literature and say that oh oh in the literature this is never reported except mr so and so has reported for the first time people may not say that they simply say that yeah so and so has reported that this result or this effect of the compound or this effect of the plant that's all you know they are not going to say the first time because the first time if at all it is really first time has to be claimed by you and how you can claim it by knowing that in literature it has not been reported earlier when i say literature it has not been reported earlier you have to go through the literature and ensure that it has not been reported earlier to claim that okay so therefore results and discussion part is really is expressing it reflects your scientific thought and your scientific contribution through your results to the field of science or to the field of research okay then there is one sentence I, uh, one point i want to mention whenever you are writing a research paper please avoid using unnecessary you know sentences which don't mean anything but you still want to write make it simple the sentences need not necessarily be complicated elegance doesn't come in writing because you make those sentences very complex and use very very sophisticated words or sophisticated terminologies sometimes they make others you know difficult to understand i have i have uh, edited several manuscripts where the authors are using words just to say the importance or significance of this particular word uh, research area and then they used words which they don't really mean that way you know and those words give a different meaning those are some words which are not familiar to us you know uh, in i have i have uh, read somewhere that you know um, the author is trying to say that you know plant research is uh, blasting the way uh, sh shining torchlight or or exploding bombs that cl clears the path for mankind to get to better treatment i was um, really shocked by looking at that you know simply he, he wanted to say that uh, herbal research has a great potential for generating newer treatments that it has a great potential to generate newer treatments versus blasting the way through you know uh, casting or whatever you know tunneling boring tunnels through mountains you don't have to say all that but people really take into i want to write like that you know but you cannot write like that unless you have writing skills only after developing several writing skills you should be able to write that but when you have developed the writing skill you realize that the sentence can be made much short but still mean the same thing i can cite something you know i this i learned when i was writing my phd thesis in university of british columbia i wrote a, 
a long sentence in my thesis. I gave it for correction. You know, uh, this sentence has almost like some 30 words or something, and my professor has corrected it. He simply cut two thirds of that sentence and joined the end portion, front portion to the end portion. And it's a, it's a perfect sentence. And it exactly means what I want to say. But what I have written in between was unnecessary. You know why I wrote all that in between? Is because I, I presumed that the simple sentence would not carry the meaning. So I was trying to build that meaning into it. But in the process, I took the meaning away. That is very important. So therefore, you write, rewrite, but make it simple, short, in the past tense, in reported speech, and beautiful manuscripts would come. That is very important. And that comes with only practice. Remember the first slides where I said, they, you know, foundations of quality writing is practice. You have to keep writing. So practicing good writing is very important. Nobody has bond with these skills, you know, always practice makes you a better writer, practice makes you a better speaker. Okay, references have to be cited in numbers in the, uh, in the order that they are cited and then listed at the end of the manuscript and references has to be cited the way the journal wants, in, you know, uh, instructions defined and References should be prepared the way the journal, the format the journal uses. There's no other way of doing it, you know, because many people fail to understand uniformity of the references and then start writing references whichever way they want. You know, I will give you a small example because everywhere examples are uh, gives you clarity. When there is a multi author paper has to be referenced. One way is to write all the author's names paper title, journal, year, you know, issue number, volume number, issue number in parenthesis, followed by page numbers. This is how some journals say, if you have a multi-author uh, paper, after three listing the first three authors, you can put a at all. Instead of listing all the authors in that manuscript. Some journals state after six authors listing, you have to place at all. Now, you know, if you submit six authors names and at all to a journal, which requires only first three authors followed by at all, the editor may be able to correct this uh, reference to his journals format by deleting author name four, five, six, and moving the at all to after three. But it's the other way around. If you put three authors names and at all, when the journal wants six authors name followed by at all, at all means and others, then this is a violation. So the paper would be returned saying that your references are not prepared according to the format necessary. Once I got a very interesting question from the author saying that no why it is accepted by that journal that journal that journal what would editor respond i responded in my very usual natural way please submit the paper to that journal why are you sending it here so referencing is very important the style of referencing is very important and it should follow journals format because a journal's quality is always decided by uniformity in the journal. How uniform the journal is following its quality, you know. So you can look at a journal and is the title uniform, is the author's names uniform, is the usages of certain terminologies, certain abbreviations uniform, citing of references is uniform, or the, at the end, the listing of the references is uniform. Or the man, uh, illustrations have the title or caption and legend are all uniform. So a journal's meticulous editing is reflected by maintenance of uniformity. Many journals want to maintain uniformity. Authors should contribute to that uniformity by following instructions to others. It is very essential. So I keep saying this. This is very essential. Please remember that. 
okay editorial policy is to ensure that manuscripts are prepared exclusively for their journal so sometimes they put very tricky referencing format american journal of physiology follows such format i am not really going into that detail because i think the uh, presentation has already gone 1 hour and 30 minutes so i don't want to take any further time i should close it down but before i have to tell you that short and rapid communications and review articles they all follow the same format of writing as in the manuscript but what is to be written in a short communication and what is to be written in a review article has to be written the way the instructions to authors define you know so therefore when you are preparing a review article it is different from a research article when you are preparing a short communication it is again different from a research article and uh, the instructions to others will define how it is different There are certain miscellaneous aspects which I want to point out is that you should take extra care to see whether you are using acronyms and abbreviated forms and how you are using in the manuscript. Because there is a style. If you want to abbreviate a form, let's say, for example, you are writing, you know, a manuscript on, let's say, um, Propranolol as a drug. Then propranolol you want to abbreviate is PRO, you know. So the PRO should be in capitals, you know, uppercase. Then first time when you use propranolol, you should write propranolol and within parents is PRO. And from then onwards, every place where you want to use propranolol, you have to use PRO, not propranolol full name why it is necessary because you abbreviated it and abbreviated abbreviation is only for indicating that from now onwards whenever i want to mention propranolol i will represent that with pro that is the undertaking you are taking you know if you have written if you have seen in any agreement it is written like this the agreement is drawn between a and b b is let us say you know so and so big name, then it's an Indian Pharmaceutical Association, here afterwards represented as IPA, you know, meaning that from the rest of the agreement, it is listed as IPA, 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 not as Indian Pharmaceutical Association. In the manuscript, you have to follow the same thing. Otherwise, don't. Nobody is forcing you to abbreviate. So therefore, either you should abbreviate or you should not. You know, this is very much necessary. Most often, the commonest mistakes I find is the symbol for ours is H, not HRS. The symbol for G is grams is G, not GMS. But you know, people write HRS and GMS without understanding and that clearly tells me that they are not paying enough attention. They don't know what is the symbol. Right? So this is Uniform usage of words, in vivo, in vitro. In vivo and in vitro are Latin words. In vivo means in life. In vitro means in glass. And there are five different forms that I can see are used. But what is the correct word is in and vivo, two separate words in italics. Why do we put in italics? Any foreign language word needs to be put in italics. And that is the journal follows. So therefore, author should not put anything other than foreign language words in italics. Some people will start writing a subtitle in italics. No, that's not accepted because it is already there in the journal. How the subtitle should be written. How a section title should be written. How, what is the font size used for title? What is the font size used for running title? What is the font size used for you know, um, keywords and what is used for everything is already listed. And if authors write without looking at that, means they have not run, they have not read instructions to others. So it's absolutely essential. See, for manuscript, there are three important components. Component one is that it follows the format as described by the journal. Component two, 
that it carries good science and good research. And component three, that it is written in proper language. These are the three very important aspects. You know, science and language is essentially contributed from Arthur Sand. How the manuscript has to be prepared and the format is provided from the journal Sand. So therefore, when you are submitting to a journal, you have to ensure that you are fulfilling the requirement of the journal first and foremost. Then the science, which is evaluated by the reviewers, and then the language, which is evaluated by the editor finally. Okay. So this is how the entire flow of work in publication. So you have to follow this flow of work. Okay. Now, finally, to end my presentation, I just want to say that. See, these publications is an index of scientific capability. A researcher's capability is evaluated by a number of publications. If you are applying for a job, they are going to ask how many publications you have. An academic job with a research background, you know, or a, or a research-oriented job. If you are applying for a grant, it says how many publications. If you are applying for a promotion, how many publications? Now, people are asking another question. What is the impact factor of the publications? Or rather, what is the impact factor of the journal in which you have published? What is the cumulative impact factor? All these things put tremendous pressure. You know, This pressure is not today. It has started way back in the 60s and 70s, You know, where professors, when they join a tenure track position, that means their position is given to them for five years. And after five years, their tenure is evaluated to give them a permanent tenure. And, they, and, and the way they are evaluated is the number of papers published during the first five years. So the, there is a saying that either you publish or perish. What do you mean that in the first five years, if you don't publish, you perish as a professor. That means your tenure will not be given, you are fired. Okay. So that fire is here in a, in, in a, in a cartoon. The dean is taking a gun and then putting a you know silencer on that and telling the professor, professor, you have not published, so you have to perish. And the perish means you will die. I'll shoot you. It's a joke, actually. What it means is that it is scientific death for the individual if he has not published. Nowadays, we say that, oh, he's a great scientist because he published 250 papers. So next, if suppose somebody comes to only publish 25 papers, then you say that oh, he's a scientist, he published only 25 papers. Great scientist, 250 papers, not on uh, OK scientist is 25 papers. So that means there is an urge, there is a pressure to publish more and more. <coughs> that publish more and more pressure put by all the people would lead to writing more and more papers. And writing is difficult job. So poor writing skills or difficulty in writing or the pressure of publications, or people who will have a writer's block. I want to write one line, but then after half an hour, I can't write that one single line because my starting has not come. You know, All these things contribute to plagiarism. Here I end my talk by saying, you know how these expert authors who have written well-read novels, fiction, writing, they write their books, don't think that they write all the time. When they have some idea, they try to write, and if they cannot write, they leave that aside and enjoy life. Suddenly, their thought will come up, and then they will take a huge break, and they go somewhere and then write a book. So they focus and keep writing, but they focus only when their mood comes. Right? That works for scientists also. You know, when you are writing a manuscript and when you when you want to write a good paper and then that day you cannot write a single sentence, don't waste your time trying to write only at that time. Leave it at that time and then think about it. And suddenly one good morning or one evening or one middle of the night, you say, oh, I can start the sentence this way. Then get up and start writing. Because that thought will not remain with you till morning. You know, you have to write it then. Whenever you, you can write, you have the thoughts, you should put it down. When you do not have the mood or words are not coming, don't waste your time sitting there. 
Many a times what happens when your thoughts don't come and when you are reading a manuscript and those sentences in that manuscript, I mean published paper, sound good. Ah, this is what I want to write. And without knowing, you start copying their sentences. And that is the origin of plagiarism. Okay. So therefore, when you cannot write, don't attempt. But keep thinking about it and start writing when you got the idea to write. Then only you can write in your own words. Okay, thank you for listening to me. And I hope I have given you a background and a complete deep insight into how a manuscript should be prepared for publication with some idea about how a good research can be designed, how a good, how a journal can be chosen based on certain conditions and how a publication and a patent are different and how you prepare a manuscript or a research paper with containing all aspects of, uh, you know, abstract all the way to references and instructions, il uh, illustrations. Thank you very much for listening. Sir, what do you organize? Sir, thank you, sir. Uh, we have some uh, questions from the participant side, sir. Right. Sir, can I display, sir? Yeah. Display or you read out? Yes. Sir, in B Farm 4.1 Pharmacy Practice School, your seminar topic must be included. It will improve writing skills. Uh, yes, for sure. You know, because I'm not claiming any proprietary right on that seminar topic. So anybody can take up that seminar topic. If you mean that I should give that seminar, I should I need to have that much time to tell you know every class. Sir, one more question, sir. <laughs> uh, high index publishers like Elsevier charges are more. If it is free journal, it takes nearly one to two years. So please suggest better journals in this context. Uh, it's very difficult to tell you what is a better journal that takes less time to publish. You know, but the traps of fast publication is uh, bad journals. They they lure they attract people by saying that you know if you if you submit your articles today, we'll publish in ten days time, fifteen days time. I know at least. 30 or 40 such journals, which advertise we are publishing September, October issue in the month of September and say that, you know, by September 30th, we'll take a decision. Uh, they are actually taking your manuscript as it is and then converting it into a PDF and publishing. They are waiting for 40, 50 papers to collect and then they publish, you know, that's not doing any service to you also. At times, even if you patiently wait, Getting it published in a journal where it is peer reviewed and a lot of editorial inputs are put to help you prepare and publish a good manuscript, it is worth the time waiting. But why you wait that time is because there are so many publications, you know, in the Indian Journal of Pharmaceutical Sciences. I'll tell you, I, today I edit, every day I edit for the publication, I mean, for bringing the issues out, you know. I continue to edit and it takes time. Sometimes I spend about three, four hours on a manuscript editing. It's easy for me to reject it and send it back to the author. But we try to help the authors by changing the manuscript. And that that takes that delays our publication. When editing time takes like our September, uh, March, April issue just completed, you know, June, July, we are starting now. So this is the delay. So please balance, you know, good journal need not be rapid and um, you know, delayed journals need not be bad. How can we calculate the H index of our own publications? Well, it's easy provided you know how many publications you have and how many of them are cited. But there should be a metrics available somewhere, you know. But this requires a, a lot of evaluation of how many times your papers are published. I'm uh, sorry, cited, accurate. 
that's very important how do you get that information so maybe there are paid sites in which you you can put in and then you can search or you can go through citation indexes and then search for each and every individual paper of yours how many times it is cited in a given period then add up all those things and divide by your number of papers then you will know can you suggest some good impact factor journals lucky you asked me a lucky question but let me tell you science is the best you know with a impact factor of 52 nature 32.5 or 40 but how can we publish in those for that you have to also indicate what field you are in and what is the special specific journal focus that you want to publish then you look at the impact factor right Uh, you see, omics, I know omics group, omics has open access journals and some of the journals omics is rapid publications. Open access journal doesn't mean that it is bad. What we really need to understand is that is there a peer review process? That's all. If the peer review process is not there, as and when um, Actually, a uh, um, journal of antimicrobials by Omics probably is a open. I don't know the journal at all. You know, I haven't seen that. No. Therefore, there is also some biases by people saying that okay, anything from this is bad, anything from this is good. So you have to, to look at from that perspective also. In the interviews, let me tell you. It is easy for the interviewer to ask questions like what is the impact factor, what is the collective impact factor, you know, which journals you have published, are they predatory? All these questions, I think they should not be asked. You know, if somebody is starting their research career, publishing a paper is important, you know. And once you paper published one or two papers, then you go for a better journal because you have a track record, you have you know capability of uh, writing. So you build it up over a period of time and take it to maybe you will have an objective of publishing in Journal of Pharmaceutical Sciences, JPS, with so much or Journal of Controlled Release, you know, with so much impact factor. You have to build your science into that, you know. If you are an MPharm student and you finished your MPharm or your PhD first paper, it cannot get published in that huge journal. So people need to understand that. But in interviews, I'm sorry, I will express my dissatisfaction openly. Some interviewers ask these questions to put the candidate in trouble. You know, that's not correct at all. The interviewer should ask candidate, find out from the candidate what the candidate knows and how best that can be utilized for the job that they are interviewing for. So that is what uh, today's session, sir. So now I'll summarize your session, sir. Thanks. So you have explained about uh, essentials of publication, like quality research work, choosing correct journal, scientific communications, patent versus publications, manuscript preparation, and proper scientific uh, working uh, writing skills. And also explained about research and design, like orient, uh, original thought quality of uh, research, well-designed research, and well-executed research. And also you have explained how to ensure the quality in research. And also, you have explained choosing a, a journal to publish. You have explained about uh, some uh, factors like JCR impact factor, SJR impact factor, H index, journal H index indicates the journal quality. And you have explained about uh, Indian Journal of Pharmaceutical Sciences and uh, some journals like rapidly publishing journals, predatory journals. And you have explained deeply about manuscript preparation and uh, some uh, skills like abstract writing skills, keywords, introduction, materials, methods, result and discussion and said reference. What more, sir? So, so many things you have explained very clearly, sir. Definitely, it will be very helpful for our faculty fidelity 
who are in the research work and uh, the bud uh, scientists also thank you sir thank you for your, your informative session now i request dr jagdish panda sir to say vote of thanks thank you thank you very much thank you very thank you very much sir for your very informative session and especially this is actually uh, many things which are supposed to take care because you know after the writing the entire the manuscript they want to send the particular journal but they before the writing the manuscript they should have to choose a journal for which they have to send that is what very clear from your uh, this today's talk sir and also the importance of the keywords as well as especially and also what do you mean by high h index and uh, choosing of the journals writing of the manuscripts these all are very wonderful sir and especially in writing the reference bibliography also how care should be supposed to take at everything hmm. we have mentioned and uh, journal choose especially it should be you know a predatory journal one should not go and rapid communication in the top most quality journals only we have should have to go for the rapid communication but uh, paid journals we should not go for the rapid uh, journal and uh, one thing sir so online journals free online journals, uh, journals are now much more are coming sir really how much it is uh, uh, advisable to go to publish in the online journals sir is it advisable okay they don't uh, have the no, no. only online the point here is there is a requirement for people to publish requirement for them and so the online journals mushroom because there are people who wish to publish rapidly and there are some publishers who want to publish there what is the objective of those publishers are editors we do not know really you know there are so many journals there are good journals which are very well you know recognized you know reputed journals but they are published by scopus or uh, so, you know clover or elsevier or nature publication group or several groups but they are so expensive people cannot afford them to publish in them and there are some journals which will take a long time publishing uh so where is the balancing act so i think some of the online journals which are promoted which are uh, you know uh, what you call the not promoted which, which many authors you know quickly published in them those journals generated uh, they came because of to fulfill the desire of authors to publish you know we have to look at it this way you know just metrics we let's look at that we have almost like 1500 pharmacy institutions in the country each one of them maybe about 1000 institutes have masters in pharmacy and everywhere there are some pharmacy students mpharm students and let's say 30000 mpharm students are graduating every year so 30000 theses 30000 requirements that the paper should have been published because again in masters defense everybody asks have you published your work so that means there is a platform required to handle 30000 manuscripts each year for publication do we have such platforms yeah where are 30000 paper publication platforms so some of these online very rapid publishing journals the names of which i know some of them but i don't want to use them. Uh, uh, can you hear me yeah yes sir audible sir so so there is a need there is a demand so some platforms have generated i know several of my friends and uh, you know research groups from different schools that i know have published in some journals like that otherwise i don't have answers for some of the questions that students are asking 
where to publish i don't have any answer even ijps i cannot provide an answer for them the reason is we take 6 months to 1 year for publication waiting time uh, there was a question here saying that uh, experimental indian journal of experimental biology which is a csir journal which is highly rated took 2 years and no response i i don't have any answer they, in in ijps also there are in the past there were incidences even now there may be incidences where people say for, i'm waiting for 2 years i don't have an answer uh, that paper has not come to me somewhere in the journal you know management system it might have been skipped or somebody some editorial assistant might have responded or you know in that uh, unsatisfactorily it's very difficult to provide independent i mean individual care to each and every manuscript by editors it is very difficult it is like principal cannot address each and every student's case he has to distribute the tasks you know so i know that many students are not satisfied with the publication platforms we are providing some publication platforms are exploiting some publication platforms are trying to help but this is how it's going to happen great sir so in future also Uh, sir excuse me sir sir uh, we have uh, two more questions sir yeah sir go you. ahead uh, for this question i don't have much of an answer if if it initially scopus index and removed and sometimes what happens uh any indexing is never always you know so again you have to apply when you apply again sometimes they say ask a tricky question we find that this this is happening with your journal so you know we have um, we not accepted this so we simply say okay fine no problem you know because journal has to fight for that indexing then sometimes it requires lot of uh, paperwork so for example pubmed indexing sometimes you know ijps at one time was pubmed indexed you know now it's not anymore because there some way of questioning came and then they said that we we don't recognize you anymore then i said no problem we don't recognize you also because you you can try but sometimes there are you know policies that changes you know they are looking at various aspects we cannot really fulfill all those so if a journal is not scopus index um, they they are not indexing is not permanent we have to renew it if a journal fail to renew it it won't be indexed if that is the answer i i already mentioned about this this, uh, this question you know indian journal of experimental biology is a csir journal so there should be a way of contacting csir earlier there used to be a, an editor you know who might have retired you know now but uh, incidentally in india my first paper was published in indian journal of experimental biology so, you know but right to sir, them it's a csir journal sir, sir we have some compliments uh, from participant side sir so just i will show you sir Sir, they, they know that I am I'm a wonderful speaker, but I don't know whether they know I am a wonderful person. <laughs> Personal attribute. Thank you, thank you very much for your uh, encouraging remark. So that will make me better. You welcome. Thank you. Sam sir is the senior principal sir. Ah I know I know. Yeah. Yes sir. uh simply stating that it's a peer reviewed journal doesn't mean that it's peer reviewed it has to be peer reviewed it has to go to reviewers and again in reviewers you have good reviewers and bad reviewers you know 
so I, you know holding hand for each manuscript to send it to a reviewer and then evaluating over a period of time it becomes automatic so uh, usually peer reviewed journals send it to um, reviewers and i do not know whether all the reviewers do a good job sometimes the reviewers don't respond many times papers get stuck there so in the journal management also there are several several issues you know one needs to understand because uh, peer rev it's a commitment from reviewers also how many scientists would commit do a committed review you know peer review uh, but uh, sahiti the answer is if the journal just states that it is peer reviewed it doesn't mean that it's peer reviewed but if you submit a manuscript and over a period of time you start receiving reports from the peer reviewers one or two then it is peer reviewed if they don't send you anything and say it's accepted now we will publish then probably it was not peer reviewed very difficult okay fine Thank Raghu College because if they haven't asked me, I would not have uh, presented this. So all credit goes to Jagdish Panda. It's all uh, your blessings and today's wonderful topic, sir. Okay. Anything okay, else? Joganda? Okay, sir. Oh, sir, at the end, uh, so I very much thankful to you, sir, on behalf of my management, on behalf of myself, my colleagues, and on, on behalf of all the participants. I'm very much thankful to you, sir, for your uh, uh, very informative and uh, very wonderful class. And uh, rather than a talk, everyone understood what is uh, importance in writing the scientific writing. And uh, and uh, thank you very much, sir, for accepting our invitation and really and uh, participate in this uh, webinar uh, to give a lecture. And uh, you are always with us at the Google College of Pharmacy. And uh, in the future also, you with us. And with your blessings, we do the best. And in the future also, as one of the experts in our college uh, to help our faculty members, whenever there is a doubt in the research writing and the research contributions, sir. And thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. You know, it's wonderful. You know, I, I still remember the time I came to your college to give a talk. <laughs> yeah, but nowadays it's only this way we can. Yes, that is sir. probably this Which is much better. We can we can have more frequent sessions. Yes, obviously, sir. Obviously, this gave you an opportunity uh, to have you like people uh, uh, with all people together. Thanks. Okay. Okay, Jagdish. So Thanks. great. Thanks. Thank you very much. Right. I can leave, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. So this is for today's session. The tomorrow session YouTube live streaming link will be forwarded to you through WhatsApp. This is Jogendra Kumar signing off today.